In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Amen. Hallelujah. This morning we continue in the message we started last week on ways glory is used in scriptures. Ways glory is used in scripture. Ways glory is used in scripture because this is our year <clears throat> of glory and strength. And may I start by saying this morning that it is the glory of God which distinguishes you among men. Amen. For us as Christians, look, there are over 8 billion people on the earth today. Yeah? Everyone involved in the rat race, running to make ends meet, to make a better future for ourselves, a better future for our family, and maybe leave something behind for our children. Many of us come from a background where we had to start from the scratch, like it was a bare background. That, that there was nothing to... Uh, it's almost like we started from a position of disadvantage. We started from a point where things were really, really bad. But we thank God for where we are today. Amen. Some of us are probably a bit luckier. We started from a position where things are, you know, it might not be, we might not be the richest and all of that, but maybe a bit of comfort here and there. Maybe from the time you were born, your parents always had a car, you always had a house you lived in, and all of that. You were always with your parents and all that. Please, if that happened to you, do not take it for granted. There are millions of people out there who didn't have that experience. Amen. I remember from my own story, from the time I was, I was probably four, four, four years old, that was the first time I noticed that oh, something is not right in our family. I didn't know the concept of fatherhood, like there being a dad around the house or anything. All I saw was there was just this woman who took care of three boys. And that was my mom. And she did everything in her power to make us comfortable, to make us comfortable. By the time I was five, I knew there was a man who was like a terror, a terrorist who would come into the house and terrorize everybody, and my brothers would run and hide, and my mom would lock herself up crying, and this man would just come into the house and rampage and move around and do things and pick up stuff and just go away. And one day I asked, who's that man? And he said, that's our dad. I said, oh, who said that? That's you. Okay. So why isn't he here with us then? No, no, no. He's not here. Okay, fine. Uh, and so each time he came and he terrorized the whole house and did things and because he wasn't living with us then and everybody, I was always wondering, why is everybody running from this man? Because I just walk up to hello, dad, and all of that. And I, hello, and all of that. And they run from me. I, I felt no fear because I didn't understand why. But people were running because of what they had had as an experience, because of the experiences they had had with him previously, and of also because of what my mom had said to them. And one day he came, and he was living in another area, another region, and he came, and I just said, okay, uh, can you buy me ice cream? I said, yeah, yeah, I'll buy you, I'll buy you ice cream. I said, can I go with you? I said, yeah, yeah, you can come with me. And that was it. Without any discussion with my mom and anything, I just, he just, get your clothes. I just took one or two clothes, jumped into his car, and off we went. And for two years, I didn't see my mom. Just went off and lived with my dad. Five-year-old, he started with, can you buy me ice cream? And he said, yes. And that was it. Five, two years, I didn't see my mom. And then I started living with my dad, and he had all kinds of people coming in into the house and things like that. And they didn't like me because I was his son. They felt I was stopping them from getting his money and all that. And after two years, I told him, I'm going to kill myself. You don't take me back to my mom. I'm sick and tired of this place. I need to go back to my mom. So he called one of his nieces and said, take it back, take it back to his mom. And all of that. And I was 
taken back to my mom. And by then, my mom had remarried and was living somewhere else. And when I arrived there, everyone looked at me like a traitor. Oh, he's the one who left and went to be with his dad and all of that. Seven years old. Having all those kind of experiences. By the time I was four, I'd broken my tie. I'd broken my tie. By the time I was four, I'd broken my time. I had a cast for weeks on end. Weeks on end. It got to a time they said they were going to amputate the leg. They were going to amputate the leg. But to God be the glory, I am alive today. And my leg is not amputated. At least the last time I checked. Hallelujah. It's still there. Amen. I just show you how God, by the time I was 10, my mom died when I was 10. My mom died. By the time I was 13, I ran back to my dad. He rejected me. He said, now, you did it the first time. You're not doing it this time. You're not living with me. And then I started moving from house to house, living from one uncle to one aunt and all of that. All and all, moving on and on. And that happened from that age 10 up until age 30. 20 years of just living here and there with people being pushed about. I became homeless again and again and again. I lost count. Isn't it amazing that now I'm head of housing for a London authority? So when I see homeless people, I understand what they're doing. Amen. I understand where they come from. So when people just say, oh, yeah, yeah, two more people came, I don't see them as statistics. I know what they have or what they are going through. And sometimes I just sit with them. I'm like, guy, it looks bad now, but it will get better with time. Amen. You just need to stay focused. You just need to get your attention in the right place and all that. Sometimes I wish I could just preach to them straight. The everlasting God and say, God changed my life. Amen. I wish I could say that to them sometimes, but I don't want to lose my job. Hallelujah. I'm not paid to say that to people. You can find ways of just gently. So I say things like, I'm a person of faith, and I believe it's a God who takes care of me. And that's just, that's me. I'm a person of faith. So it's something you need to consider. I am a person of faith, and that works. And that works for me. I said that once to the leader, to the leader of my council, a politician, the biggest man in our borough, and all of that. And I said, I had sickle cell when I was young. I had sickle cell. It was terrible. Always on medication, always in hospital. And, all that. and then he said, so what happened? How did you get healed? What happened to you? I said, sir, I'm a person of faith. And God healed me when I was 17. Healed me of sickle cell. And from 17 all the way till now, no hospital visits, no sickness, no folic acid. I do all the things I want to do. Why? Because God healed me. End of story. I am a living testimony of somebody God healed of sickle cell. So when I see people with sickle cell today, when I see people in crisis, my heart goes out to them. When I see young people being ill, being sick, my heart goes out to them because I've been there. Crisis, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, just screaming and shouting and crying. And they're like, what is, what are you feeling? Like, I can't describe it. I am just in pain. But you see, they say, God who steps in into your affairs and he changes your story. I pray that same God who visited me will visit you in the name of Jesus Christ. So the word glory is used to describe the presence of God in our affairs. When God shows up in our lives, his glory shows up. If we continue to run like everybody else, drive to work, uh, buy a bus pass, go by train, do what everybody else is doing, then our results will not be different. We will be like everyone else. But when we connect to the God of glory, then he makes us different from what other people 
are going through. Can I have an amen? So last week we looked at the first five ways the word glory is used in the scriptures. And I'll quickly run through that and then I'll give us the rest for today. So we said number one, glory describes the material wealth or substance that you have. When God blesses you with material wealth, it means your glory has increased. That's in Genesis chapter 31, verse 1. Number two, and by the way, the message is on YouTube. Just go on YouTube, Transformation Sanctuary, at Transformation Sanctuary, find the message. All our messages, at my last count, we've got over 300 messages, either Sunday service or Thursday Bible study on our YouTube channel. Hallelujah. Over 300 we've got there, which you can just go in at leisure, click on play whilst you are doing your business around the house or driving to work or somewhere, click on play, put in your headphones and listen again and again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God at Transformation Sanctuary. So the first part of this message is there. It's uploaded there. We upload each message every week so that it's always there for safekeeping. So that's the first one. The second one, the power and authority we enjoy among men is also described as glory. Joseph said in Genesis 45, 13, so you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt. What was he talking about? He was the prime minister. So the position and authority we enjoy among men is described as glory. Number three, the visible manifestation of God. When God shows up, and we saw that again and again in the Old Testament, he came down on Mount Sinai. There was a cloud. There was fire. And for seven days, people saw that. Like I said last week, when you go out in the night, I need to use the toilet, I'm going out. When you go out, you just see light everywhere. Why? Because on Mount Sinai, there was that light burning, and it didn't stop. For seven days, it was burning because that was the glory of the Lord revealed to men. The Bible says when the temple was being dedicated and Solomon was praying, the Bible says as he prayed, the cloud of glory came down and filled the temple. The Bible says, and the priest could not minister. Everybody stood transfixed because they couldn't see one another clearly because the cloud of glory had filled the place. Up until now, people saw God's glory from a distance. But in this one, he came in into the temple where they were and everybody just stood transfixed in that atmosphere of glory, in that atmosphere of glory. When God visited Ezekiel and God came in his mother, in his Lamborghini and they visited Ezekiel, Ezekiel saw the glory of God, the wheels within the wheels and the four cherubs who stood and carried the dome, the dome in which God sat on his throne in his car. And Ezekiel saw that that was another manifestation of God's glory. And then we said, the praise and honor we give to God via our action and character, the way we live our lives, the way we conduct ourselves, that is another use of the word glory. And the last one we said for last week is our tongues giving praise to God. Hosanna, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us, worthy of all our praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, come up your way amongst us. We welcome you here, Lord Jesus. When we sing Hosanna to him, when we sing you are good and your mercies endure forever, our tongues giving praise to God is another expression of glory is another expression of glory so i'm going to move on very quickly with the last with the last set for today so the next one 
first one for today is God's miracles in our lives. When God performs his miracles in our lives, that is an expression of glory. You see, God loves to heal us. Amen. If anybody ever tells you that God loves for you to be sick, that's a lie. God wants us to be healed. We may get sick because we are humans. We are but humans. Even the best of us are still humans. We go around. We have polluted air everywhere. We stress ourselves out. We catch a cold. Our body tells us, I'm not working as I should. We may get sick, but it is God's pleasure. God's glory to heal us. Amen. Because when God heals you, one, you're able to continue to serve him. You're able to continue to take care of your family. And then people can see you and you can be an expression of that glory. In Luke chapter 7, this man, in Luke chapter 7, they brought this child to Jesus. The child was deaf and the child couldn't speak properly. And Jesus looked at the child and called him to himself. And the Bible says, he touched his hair and he sighed. Ha! People are suffering. He sighed. Ah. But he didn't stop at sign. He said, Ephatah. Meaning, be open. And the Bible says straight away, his ear was unblocked, his tongue was looped, and he was able to speak. And people who were there, who saw what happened, what did they say? They said, behold, he has done all things well. The deaf hear and the dumb speak. That is what God wants to do in our lives. Can I have an amen? That he, when he performs his miracles in our lives, it's an expression of his glory. And I pray that God will manifest himself to us this year in the name of Jesus Christ. In Exodus 16, verse 10 to 12, Exodus 16, verse 10 to 12. The children of Israel, they've been traveling through the desert. You know, I always say, before you blame people, you have to think about the experience they have been through. Before you say, oh, why did you behave like that? Why did he say what he said? You've got to put yourself in their shoes. Um, someone said, before you seek to be understood, try to understand first. So you know when two people are arguing and somebody said, well, what happened was yesterday morning I woke up and you didn't say good morning and blah, blah, blah. And as they continue talking in your mind, you're thinking about your answer to what they've said and you're just waiting. Finish, 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 finish. I'll give you my own too. Oh yeah, but you too, you didn't say good night yesterday. That only leads to more quarrel and all that. If you force seek to understand the other party, before you are understood, then there will be less problems. So in Exodus chapter 16, children of Israel traveling through the desert, and they were hungry. They had been eating manna, and they were like, we're sick and tired of this manna. No one's giving us meat. God provided, Psalm 78, he provided, and God furnished a table in the wilderness. Yes, he's performed other miracles, but can he do this one? And God said to them, in Exodus chapter 16, 10 to 12, he says, Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, that they looked towards the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Exodus 16, 10 to 12, verse 11, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaints of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord. It was a miracle he performed in the wilderness. He said, In the evening you will eat meat, and in the morning, you will be filled with bread. I pray none of us will hunger this year in the name of Jesus Christ. Now, sometimes we feel like we're in the wilderness, but God will provide meat for our needs. Hallelujah. 
Second one for today, God's radiance on our outward appearance. You know when people tell you, you look really well and all of that, don't discount it. It is God's glory upon your life. Amen. There are people who try and use everything in and outside of the book and yet it's not working. Somebody said there is no, no I'm not going to go into the bright bit and all that. So when God's radiance is upon you, when God has given you good health, when God has given you, when God has given you life and all of that, that is his glory upon you. Amen. And we see the example of Moses in Exodus 34, Exodus 34, 19 to 20, Exodus 34, 19 to 20, Exodus 34, sorry, 29 and 30, Exodus 34, 29 and 30. He says, now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of testimonies were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone and they were afraid to come near him. What does that tell us? The more you spend in God's presence, the more his glory is seen on your life. Amen. The more you spend in the place of prayer and worship, the more radiant you look when you, are, when you appear before people. It's something they always say where I work. They always say, Vincent, why are you always smiling? You're always smiling. Why are you always smiling? Ah, there are all these challenges we're going through, and yet you are smiling. And some of them will say, well, as long as you are smiling, then there is hope for the rest of us. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's true. I know that. But I always have a reason to smile. Why? Because before the day starts, I've settled all of this in God. I've handed the day, I've handed everything I'm going to go through, I've handed them over to God, I've prayed, and all of that. So when I come out, I don't come out alone. I don't come out, oh, you know, I didn't just wake up and rush straight from from the bedroom straight into the bathroom, brush my teeth, and then I'm out and about. No. A man of God once said, he said, I have a very busy day ahead of me today. So I've decided to take out more time to pray before I go out. Did you get that? I have a very busy day ahead of me. What would most of us do? Start up the day. It's going to be a very, very busy day. I've got to travel. I've got to go egg. I've got to do Y and all that. We just start out. But this man knew the secret of God's glory upon things that he does. So he said, I have a very busy time today ahead of me. I must take out more time to pray. I must take out more time to pray. So, God's radiance on our outward appearance is his glory in our lives. Amen. Number three, God's work in nature. God's work in nature. And that's in Psalm 19, verse 1. Psalm 19, verse 1, that includes the heavens and the earth. Psalm 19, verse 1, what does it say? Psalm 19, verse 1. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. So when you're reading through scripture and the Bible talks about glory, sometimes it refers to God's work in nature. And sometimes you have to go on a holiday and go to some places. I remember the last time we were at Bournemouth, just Bournemouth, Bournemouth, not far away, Bournemouth, two hours away, and all that. And when I saw the way the waves were crashing against the rock, against the rocks, again and again, it was just a demonstration. For me, it was a wow time, a demonstration, a demonstration of God's glory. In Psalm 57, verse 11, 
Psalm 57 verse 11. He says, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. Be exalted, O Lord, above the heavens. Let your glory be above all the earth. So that's three so far. Number four, what does the word glory in scripture represent? Now, why are we saying this? So that you know which one of these you can appropriate to your life in this year of glory. In this year of glory. Number four, God's kingdom and its splendor. God's kingdom. So again, when you go through scripture, God's kingdom and its splendor is referred to when we use the word glory. God's kingdom and its splendor. Psalm 145 verse 11. Psalm 145 verse 11 says, They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power. God's kingdom is a glorious kingdom. Amen. We are God's children. Psalm 145 verse 11. We are God's children and we are in a kingdom. This is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not something you are waiting for. There is a kingdom of heaven. We know we are going to that. And I'll give you a scripture around that. Psalm 73 verse 24. Psalm 73 verse 24. He says, you will guide me with your counsel. Meaning all through my life, you will lead me. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. There is a glory we are going to. That's the kingdom of heaven where God dwells. We are going to that. But whilst we are on earth, we are already in his glorious kingdom. We are in the kingdom of God. So there's a difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. God is everywhere. God is in heaven. God is on the earth. His kingdom is everywhere. And when you are a child of God, you dwell in his kingdom. But there is the kingdom of heaven, just like you have the kingdom of earth, the kingdom of heaven where God currently dwell. So when we talk about God's kingdom as believers, a place where we are sons and daughters, a place where we are all equal with before God, a place where we enjoy what Jesus has paid for, that is God's kingdom. How we tell to people, never feel, never apologize for being a Christian. Amen. You know, sometimes this unbelievers, the, the way they move and with all the swagger and all of that, you are almost like, oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm sorry. I'm a Christian. Never be sorry. Never be sorry for being a Christian. And all of that. Uh, the other day, um, we were going for a workout scene. I said, oh, let's go to the pub because they, they, they have nice food there and all of that. They will eat there and all that. And I said, uh, I said oh, and my boss said, and I'll buy all of you drinks. I don't drink. Oh, thank you. Thank you very, very, very much for the offer. But I do, not, I do not drink. I've never drank. I never will. I don't drink. And all of that. And we got, <laughs> and we got there. We got there on Friday. And when we got there, and we sat down, and all of that. And of course, they had ordered their beers and all of that. And I had my lemonade. And then he turned to me. I said, Vincent, have you ever been to a pub? And I just laughed. I said, yes, I have. And all that. But I don't drink. Work has brought me to the pub many times for whatever reason and all that. Well, I'm not antisocial. I'm like, no, 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 go, go. I'm not going to go. No, go. But I'll drink my lemonade. And after they've had three cups and they told me, yes, Vincent. Like, so why, why don't you drink? <laughs> and like you see, foolishness. Alcohol is taking over their life. Look at them. <laughs> and all that silly people. I'm <laughs> like, I do not drink. Thank you very much. And all of that. Amen. Never apologize for being a Christian. 
Why? Because you are in a glorious kingdom. First Peter 2 9. First Peter 2 9. Let's look at that very quickly. First Peter 2 9. Who are you in Christ? First Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. Who are you in Christ? Look at this. First Peter 2 9. He says, But you, that's you and I. He says, But you are a chosen generation. You know what that means? In every generation, there will be lots of people. But you are the special ones, the chosen generations. Others may be on their way to hell. You are the chosen generation. Others may die of a pandemic. You are the chosen generation. The economic impact may affect people, but you are the chosen generation. Storm Eunice may kill people just like that, but you are the chosen generation. You know what always bothers me? Every time you hear that a storm is coming to the UK, what goes through your mind? I'll tell you what goes through my mind. Oh, a storm is coming. Okay. Okay. Um, we stay at home. Okay. Okay. Yeah, we'll be fine. Nothing more. I never think uh, my roof will be torn off, my windows will cave in, or a tree will fall on my car. It just doesn't cross my mind. And my wife, bless her. If there was a storm which came, I've forgotten the name of the storm. 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Darling, are we walking today or are we not? Oh, yeah, yeah let's walk, let's walk. And the storm was blowing and the wind was ferocious. And here we are in the wind, walking against the wind all the way from Raynham to Dagenham. And I said to her, I said, if this wind should sweep us into the road and we get knocked off by a car, what would be our excuse? People would just say, foolish people. There was a storm blowing. What are you doing outside? But it's because we just felt nothing bad will happen to us. But have you noticed? That when you watch the news, you always hear that, oh, two people died, three people died, the tree fell from the sky and landed on someone as they were about to enter Tesco, and they died. Or someone was in their car, and something just landed on the car and crushed them to death. The Bible says, you are a chosen generation. Evil things may happen to other people but it is not going to happen to you. Can I have an amen? So he says, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Can you see glory in God's kingdom? You are royalty. You might not be Prince Charles's cousin, nephew, niece, and all of that. Even his own son is struggling at the moment with identity crisis. But you are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people. You're special to God. Somebody say, I am special to God. You are special to God. God loves you, watches over you, keeps you, and you may not see it, you may not feel it, but it doesn't mean it is not happening. I've got two boys. And sometimes their mother and I are thinking, okay, so what are they going to do? We need to buy this for them. We need to do this. We need to do that. And all of that. Blah, 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 blah. Already there's a strike on coming on second. Now this train, you know these train people, they need to wake up. You know? They're not junior doctors and they're always going to strike. Like, what's wrong with them? They got the message. They got the message. You know, <laughs> so there's a strike on February 2nd. And this morning already we are thinking, ah, these boys will be going to school and all that. What are we going to do? So we raised it with them today. But we had had the discussion. Their mother and I had had a discussion previously. How are they going to get to school on Friday and all that? What are we going to do? Oh, we also have an appointment. How are we going to manage that and all that? That is exactly how God works with us. 
You may not see it, you may not be there, you may not hear it, but God, the Bible says, He is mindful of us. You know what that means? His mind is full of us. Amen. Did you get it? He is always thinking about us. The Bible says we are the apple of his eyes. He says we are written in the palm of his hands. That is the God we serve. So he says you are his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him, that's God, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous life. His kingdom is a marvelous kingdom. Amen. It's a glorious kingdom. Never apologize again for being a Christian because Sam says, come taste and see that the Lord is good. If people only knew what you are enjoying, then they will come and join you there. Okay, moving on. Because of time, I've got three more to give us and we'll round up for today. The next one, when you use the word glory in scripture, it describes God's presence and dealings with people. God's presence and dealings with people. God's presence and dealings with people or God's presence in our lives. God's presence, you know, the way God deals with us individually and collectively is referred to as his glory. God's presence and dealings with his people. Proverbs 25 verse 2. Proverbs 25 verse 2. This is probably one of the reasons why we pray actually. Proverbs 25 verse 2. He says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But the glory of kings is to search out a matter. Can you see the difference? It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search out a matter. Remember the story of Elisha and the Shunammite, isn't it? Shunammite woman. What was the story? There was this woman, she and her husband lived together. They were fine, they were rich, super rich, very, very rich had livestock, had all kinds of things. But they didn't have any children. And by this time, the man was old. The man was aged. And, and the woman noticed that every year, Elijah comes through their town and then maybe he holds a crusade or two and then he moves on to the next time. So she will attend the crusade and things like that. Also. So one day she said to her husband, Ah, James, you know what? Let's convert a lot. Let's build a lot. A room there and all that. For, so that when the man of God comes in into town, he has somewhere to stay. He doesn't have to stay in a hotel every time or from one place to another. They said, let's, do it, let's do a lot conversion and he can stay there when he comes. And the husband, interestingly, agreed. He didn't say, ah, you want to bring another man into this house? Yeah, that's your plan now. Bring another man into this house. So, because you can't have a baby through me, you want to try through someone else. You know, sometimes the way people think. So that's what the man didn't say no. Second lesson there for me is when you make room for God, he makes room for you. Amen. When you, you know, when you, you know, when you give to God because you're expecting that He'll give back to you, you probably get less. But when you give to Him just out of Lord, I love you, and we always give to people we love. When you give out of your heart genuinely, say, Lord, what I have may be little, but because I know you are the one who sustains me, I am giving to you. There's a song that we listened to this morning, Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. I am giving my best to you, Lord. When you do that, God gives his best also to you. So the woman told her husband, can we please build a lot for this man of God? And the guy said, okay, yeah, fine. So they built it. So every time Elijah came to town, I was like, I've got a room here, sir. That's your room. Nobody else will use the room. It is yours. You can keep your belongings there and all that. And 
Elijah, Elijah was happy. He didn't have to stay in a hotel. Eat, uh, ordered food, food they order, and things like that. He was very happy. And then one day he said, he said to his servant, he said, look, these people we're with are rich. They're believers. They're rich. They've got everything. What can we, how can we repay them? Because you see, whenever you do something for God, he always looks for ways to repay you. Whatever you give to God, he will always be like, you can't outgive me. You've given me this. I am going to give you more. When you give your time to God, he always says, ah, I've got to bless you back. When you give your money to God, when you give your service to God, he would always say, no, 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 no. You will never outgive me. So when you give to me, I must give you back. So Elisha said, oh, how can we be of help to them? They've got money, they've got cars, they've got farmlands, they're known to the king, they're people of influence, and all that. How can we help them? And then trust the servant, the people who see everything happening. He said, you know, that's why you need to be good to those who are below you. Amen. At work, be good to those who are below you. At home, be good to your junior ones. Wherever you are, be good to those who are below you. Why? Because sometimes they are the key which will unlock your miracle. Gehazi said, the woman doesn't have a child. Remember Naaman, the general. How did he get his miracle? His slave girl. Couldn't even come to him. So the slave girl went to his wife and said, Mommy, if daddy will go to Israel and meet with Elisha, this problem will be gone. And the general didn't despise or disparage what the girl said. He acted on it and he got his miracle. Anyway, back to the story. So Gehazi said, they don't have children. Ah, <laughs> we can help them with that. Call the woman, call the woman. So he called her. I said, ma'am, you've been very, very good to us. And to God be the glory. He said, and may I just tell you that by this time next year, you know, he didn't pray, he didn't fast and all that. By this time next year, you have your baby. And the woman said, uh, sir, 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 like Sarah, uh, please do not lie to your maid servant. I've waited years and it hasn't happened. Do not lie to me. I said, I'm not lying to you. You can't outgive God. You built this lot for God. He will give you children. True to form. Year later, the woman had a child. And the child grew. And the child will come. And he saw the child. The child was growing. And then one day, suddenly, the child died. And the woman got her donkey and ran to Elijah, who wasn't with them then, but Elijah was in the city. Ran to Elijah. And held on to his leg. And Gehazi came and you can't do that to the man of God. And Elisha said something which leads to where I'm going with this. Elisha said, something has happened to the woman and the Lord has not revealed it to me. That scripture, see that scripture again? See how it makes sense? The scripture we just read. What does it say again? This iPad. He says, Proverbs 25, verse 2. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. But the glory of kings is to search out the matter. God conceals it. We search it out. Find it in the place of prayer. Because when you do that, God uses it to promote you to the next level. Can I have an amen? Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, forgot the dream, wanted the dream and the interpretation. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. God showed him and then took it away from him. And then God gave it to Daniel. And Daniel, the Bible says, when Daniel told the king the dream and the interpretation, he said, bring incense, bring offering. Everybody fall down and worship Daniel. And they all did. And then they said, no, 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 no. You see, worship God. Don't worship me. I'm just a human. They said, no, you are not a human. You are a God. So, when the king then made 
the golden statue. Bible student, going somewhere with this. When the king made a golden statue, do you now know why Daniel was not asked to bow down to him? Because he himself was a was seen as a what? As a god who they had made obeisance to. Gods don't bow down to God. He was seen as a god. So when he said, everybody bows, I said, no, no, not Daniel. We know you are a god yourself and all that. So you don't need to. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and others, you need to bow. And we know they did not bow. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the glory of kings to search it out. The more God gives you solutions for your generation, the higher that takes you in life. Amen. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, and it was about AI, artificial intelligence. And the guy said something which blew my mind. He said, get into the business of AI now. He said, because in the 50s, when they spoke about, uh, what was the first one you mentioned? When they spoke about, was it websites? He spoke about, there were two. They talked about websites, was it emails or mobile phones or the second one? He said, when they said, every internet, everyone will use the internet. He said, at that time, people said, it's impossible. It's not going to happen. He says, so it takes 10 years before everybody latches on and the market will become saturated and all that. He said, but guess what? Those who always get in early will make a fortune before others get in. So I was listening to the podcast yesterday. He said, get in. He said, if there's any business to do right now, get in into the AI business. Because in 10 years' time, it's going to become the normal way we do everything. Everything from Zoom to Internet and all of that. He said it will become the normal way. He said when the mobile phone, when telephone first came out, everybody wasn't involved in it. It grew until now. Everybody has a phone. So if you get in at the inception and you use it to solve people's problems, you're made for life. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. It is the honor of kings to such a... You know, sometimes we're praying in church, Lord, break through, Lord, lift us up, Lord, bless us. All God will do is give us ideas. If we work on it, we get the blessing. If we don't, we don't get the blessing. So, God's presence are dealing amongst us. Glory. Two more, and we'll round up this morning. I'm sure my wife will be like, we're running over time already. Um, number six, God's infinite light in which he dwells. Heaven's presence, God's presence, the light in which he dwells is referred to as glory. Um, Exodus 33, 18 to 22. Exodus, we won't read it because we're rounding up now. Exodus 33, 18 to 22. And... 1 Timothy 6, 16. 1 Timothy 6, 16. He says, who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honor and everlasting power. Amen. God dwells in this light who no one can come to. That is his glory. And finally, finally, in the scripture, when you look at the word glory, it is used to refer to the honor men receive and give to others. The honor we receive and we give to one another. The honor we receive and we give to one another. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 35. Proverbs 3, 35. Proverbs 3, 35. Proverbs 3, 35. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 35. He says, The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. It means when we think about fools, and I'm sure you can think about some people in our lifetime who have been fools or foolish. And when we think of what they've done, we know that that was their legacy. He said, But we, because we're wise, 
He says, we will inherit glory. Amen. I'll give us one more scripture. Um, so what about a way a nation? Let's look at it from a national perspective. Isaiah 17 verse 4. Isaiah 17 verse 4. Isaiah 17 verse 4. The last scripture for this morning. Isaiah 17 verse 4. He says, in that day, it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will wane, reduce, diminish, and the fatness of his flesh grow lean. Jacob there talks about the nation of Israel. He says, in that day it shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob will diminish. I pray for you today, your glory will not diminish in the name of Jesus. It is your year of glory to glory. Your glory will only rise in the name of Jesus. Whatever you do, the Lord will take you from glory to glory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. So we see ways then in which the word glory is used in scripture. I've given you all of this so that when you are praying, you can pray each one into your life. Lord, your manifest presence in my life, the miracles you perform in my life, the light that surrounds me that makes it impossible for darkness to come near me. Lord, your work in nature, your miracles, my tongue giving praise to you, my lifestyle giving praise to you. I am a chosen generation. That is what it means to enjoy God's glory. Let's bow down our heads to pray. Let's bow down our heads to pray. Father, our dear Father, we thank you this morning once again. We thank you because it is your desire that we experience your glory. We thank you because 2024 is a year of glory and strength. Father, we pray for one another this morning that indeed may we experience your glory in all that we do in the name of Jesus. We've seen men whose lives were changed, transformed because they experienced your glory. We've seen prayers answered, situations turned around, lives transformed because of your glory in their lives. Father, may that same power that has worked for others in time past may work for us in the name of Jesus. May we experience your glory and your strength in all that we do this year in the name of Jesus. Visit us all, Father, in the name of Jesus. As we go into this week, may it be a week of glory, may it be a week of blessing, may it be a week of increase, promotion, Lord. Good news, testimonies in the name of Jesus. We love you, Lord. We exalt your name in Jesus' mighty name. We are praying.